Let us pray. <clears throat> our Heavenly Father, we thank you for our scripture lesson from Matthew today. As we begin to look at the words of envy and jealousy, it is clear cut what Jesus is trying to say in this parable. May the Holy Spirit come upon us, for we ask this in the name of the Father, the Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. There was a story that I was reading about a, um, a lady in England who married Webster, and she lived in a little village, and she had a beautiful garden. Well, her neighbor also had a garden, and there was this competition in the town about who had the best garden like once a year. Well, Marion always seemed to win. Uh, she had beautiful flowers and arrangements, and she took great care of her garden. Well, then one day when she came out after she had won the prize, she noticed that her garden had been destroyed. She walked out there, she was very angry, and the first thing she thought of was her neighbor next door. She said, she was always jealous of me. Every time I would get the medal every year, she would complain about it. She said, I bet you she trained the squirrels to come over here and destroy my garden. Well, I don't know how you train squirrels to go over and destroy somebody's garden. But she was very envious of this other lady. And she actually, you know, was wrong. I mean, something happened and her garden was destroyed. But as we begin to look at our Bible lesson this morning, the laborers in the vineyard, there's a man who owns a vineyard. And if you know anything about, um, you know, a lot of these farms, especially growing up in South Jersey, uh, tomatoes and blueberries are a very big thing when you get near Hamilton and you begin to go down near Glassboro, places like that. And a lot of times during the harvest season, you'll see buses coming in from Philadelphia, from Trenton, different places bringing workers in uh, to work in the field. Well, this was harvest time. And so there were laborers in the field early in the morning. And then we begin to read on around nine o'clock. He goes into town, he's the owner, and he sees these idle workers. And he says, why don't you work? He says, well, no one has hired us. He says, well, I'm gonna hire you. Come, come to my farm and you can you know, pick what I have. Well, this went on several times during the day where he would hire different people. In fact, as we begin to look at nine o'clock, 12 o'clock, three o'clock, and then close to like four o'clock and then quitting time was around five o'clock when it started to get dark. Well, here he told uh, the, the master of taking care of everything, he said, I want you to bring all the workers here together and I want you to pay uh, the last people that came first and then go down to those that came early. Well, the workers began to notice we're paying everyone the same wage. The people that came later are getting the same wage as those that came very early. And they were very angry. They said, you know, we were working all day and what happened here, you're paying everyone the same. And this is what the owner said, he said, um, take what belongs to you and go. I choose to give to this last the same as I give to you. Am I not allowed to do what I choose with what belongs to me? Oh, you envious, are you envious because I am generous? So the last will be first and the first will be last. Now those two, those last words, the last will be first and the first will be last. Now, there are many examples in the Bible of envy and jealousy. When we look at Cain and Abel, Cain became very jealous of his brother Abel, and he killed him. When we see Joseph, Joseph was, you know, the favorite little boy of, of the father. He had older brothers and sisters. His dad gave him this coat. His brothers became very jealous, and actually they just, you know, sold him into slavery, and he ends up in Egypt. Then there's King Saul and, and, and David, where King Saul has these mighty armies and Goliath is coming. So who kills Goliath? The shepherd boy named David. And King Saul became very envious of David and was trying to kill him. Then we see Herod, uh, when the Messiah was born, when Jesus was born. You know, tell me where the child is. I want to go and worship this child. He wasn't going to worship Jesus. He was going to go there and kill Jesus. And then Judas, there at the Last Supper. 
Judas is there, and he's very envious of, of Jesus and turns him in for a few coins. It runs through the Bible, envy and jealousy. What we begin to look at, people are saying, well, there's other people that are getting ahead of us. They have the better grades in school. Um, you know, many college students complain, especially some colleges have what they have, the bell curve. And you know in certain classes that there's a certain pass group of the, of the class is going to pass, and then there's certain that aren't. A bell curve. And then, especially in labs, like in science, you see students sabotaging other people's notes just to get ahead. A car. You see someone with a very expensive car and say, boy, you know, I wish I had a car like that. Or a job, you know, like, why wasn't I promoted? Why are they bringing someone in from the outside and, and giving them a promotion? At the gym, you know, people that, that work hard and they, they get in, in shape, and then other people that just go and, you know, kind of talk like me <laughs> and, and don't really work out, you know, you, you don't get the results. But I can remember two examples. In Bristol, Pennsylvania, there's an Episcopal church that goes back before the American Revolution. There's a lot of very famous families that are buried there. The Campbell Sioux people, they're buried there. Uh, also, Gregory Peck, the actor, when his daughter was playing in a play at the Playhouse in Bristol, he came to the town for a couple of days and he's walking around. Very nice gentleman, very good looking man. Gregory Peck, he also had relatives buried in the cemetery. But in this particular cemetery, there was one man who had a lot of money, and his tombstone, he had like a, a, like a cone that went up about 12 feet high. And then on the bottom of it, he had his name. And, you know, it was really bragging about himself, about his business and all that. Well, another man next to him who had graves, but would see that he says, you know, my relatives are gonna come and they're gonna see this 12 foot high, you know. Well, I'm gonna build the same thing, but I'm only gonna make it four feet high. And right next to it, there's this real large tombstone and then another one that's only four foot high. Another example in the town that I grew up in, if you ever go through um, the little town before Ocean City, um, you know, as you get off the, the San Atlantic City Expressway and you're going into the town on the first exit, that's kind of what Elmar looks like, you know, like working class homes, you know, that are there. Well, in my hometown, you have all these working ha uh, class homes, you know, one floor, no basements, maybe three bedrooms, two bedrooms, whatever. Well, in this one corner, this old house was torn down. And this guy was building like a house with like maybe 10 rooms and five bathrooms on it. It was just totally out of place for the town. But then he ran out of money. And it, it's still there. Like when you go down Browning Road, and as you go to go into my street where I grew up, this gigantic, un, gigantic un, unfinished house is still there. You know, people that are trying to show off, people that are trying to say, I'm going to have a better house than you. Well, number one, the first step when we look at envy and jealousy is that they exist. Leonard Bernstein, the famous conductor and composer, was once asked the question, what is the hardest instrument to replace in the orchestra or musician? He said, the second fiddle. You think he would say the first, the first violin, but he said the second violin. And then the reporter says, well, why the second violin? They don't have such a, a hard piece as the first violin. He says, because I have to pick someone that has enthusiasm. They may sit there and say, you know, the other first violin is way better than me, and I'm just gonna play along. But he said, the second violin is so very, very important because you have to pick someone who has enthusiasm about playing second violin. The second thing is to develop a strong attitude of gratitude. Let's face it, most of us are blessed in life. 
<laughs> we might not be the richest person in town. We might not have the biggest car. We may be struggling to pay our bills. But just turn on your television set or the newspaper. Look at the people around the world where many are starving. They're starving. Or these little children that have a goiter or they can't walk straight because of an illness. And then the hospital comes in, the hospital ship comes in and starts to take care of these young people. But most of us are pretty much blessed, are blessed in our life. There's a true story of a mountain climber who uh, climbed a lot of famous mountains in his life. And one of the things that he did, when he got to the very top of the mountain, he would get on his knees and he would pray. And when he was being interviewed, he said, well, why do you do that? He said, because I'm showing gratitude that I was able to get to the top of the mountain and that I'm blessed that I was able to do that. The third point is some of the happiest people in the world have a servant attitude. People that want to serve. They don't want to be recognized. They don't want to be noted for the things that they do. True story again, uh, famous pastors in England, E.B. Meyer and G. Campbell Morgan, two very great evangelists. Well, E.P. Uh, Moyer didn't get the same amount of crowd as G. Campbell Morgan did. And one of the things that he came to the conclusion, he said, we're both doing the Lord's work. And it doesn't matter that he gets a larger crowd and I get a smaller crowd. The point is we're working for the kingdom of God. Now, as we look very closely at our scripture lesson, there's several things that come out. There's a sense of warning to the disciples. Jesus is getting near the end of his ministry. And what he wanted to say to them is this morning, some of you will be successful and some of you won't. Some of you will lose your life and some of you won't. But the most important thing, that regardless, that you are all working for the same goal, a warning to the disciples. You know, our Jewish brothers and sisters uh, at sundown, Yom Kippur uh, starts, and that goes in tomorrow evening. So a lot of the synagogues, I don't know if they go to the synagogue, I think they do. But there's several things with Yom Kippur is that they are not allowed to eat, not allowed to have a meal from sundown to tomorrow evening. Also, they're not allowed to bathe. They're not allowed to work. Uh, also, uh, some of the other things that they do is that they ask forgiveness for anyone or anything that they hurt during the past year. If they hurt someone in Yom Kippur, they are to make amends. They go and they pray and they say, you know, I, I said something to my brother or my sister, or I did something in the community, I'm so sorry for that. Lord, will you forgive me? So Yom Kippur is a very important holiday with our Jewish brothers and sisters. So tonight at sundown to tomorrow, um, many of our Jewish brothers and sisters will be asking for forgiveness from God for anyone that they may have slighted in life. Also, that there is comfort in God, that we find comfort in God. Also, compassion of God, that, that God allowed his son to die for us where he didn't have to. There is this compassion and comfort and then the generosity of God, <clears throat> that he is giving us a free gift of eternal life. And that's so very important for us to remember as Christians that we have the opportunity of eternal life. But the most important thing that comes out of our scripture lesson is the spirit in which we work. The spirit in which we work. Now one of the most important things when we begin to look at that, many times over the years I've heard Christians say, well, I've been a member of that church since I, I was baptized in that church. And, you know, then new people come in, and it's sort of like what we have to remember, what is being said here, it doesn't matter when you come to the kingdom of God, whether you came at birth, or whether you came at the last minute on your, on your deathbed. 
The most important thing is that you came into the kingdom of God. And that God isn't standing there and saying, well, so-and-so came June 20th, 1945, and this other person here just two days ago became a Christian. And within the Christian community, what is important is to bring all people into the kingdom of God, regardless of whether that time was. Not to have a time thing or a time slot or a punch card, you know, like with workers, you know, you go in and you hit the time clock. No, that's not what Christianity is about. It's about being saved by the grace of God. And so when we look at our scripture lesson this morning, I can understand the workers being mad that they were, that the people that came later got the same pay that they did. I can understand that. It's human nature. But there's things in human nature that we can't change. And the things that we can't change, we need to move forward. Things in life that can't be changed, just move on. Move on and have more blessings from God. When we look at the scripture lessons, it says, Seek ye first the kingdom of God, and all these things shall be added unto you. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, our scripture lesson this morning at first glance is kind of difficult to understand. We can really understand the workers that were there all day getting the same pay as people that came maybe at 3 o'clock or 4 o'clock where they became jealous or envious. But this lesson that Jesus is sent telling to his disciples is that there's going to be people coming into the church at different times. They may come in when they're by their families bringing them at baptism, or they may come in as a teenager, or they may come in as an adult. The most important thing is that we give our hearts to God. Amen. You know, this past week, um, the South District and the East District met together and it was an all-day workshop on the clergy and so many clergy are suffering right now through depression uh, they're suffering through uh, the diff difficult things that have especially because of COVID has affected so many clergy and one of the most important thing is that within the church we need to be in prayer for each other we need to be uplifting and caring. And so as we continue with our service and as we sing our last hymn, Blessed Be the Tide That Binds, let us be grateful that we are Christians. So many of the clergy, which I was really surprised, several said that up until age maybe 45 or 50, they were atheists. And then the Lord came into their hearts, and then they entered into the ministry as Christ servant ministers or as lay pastors and felt the presence of God. The most important thing is that we give ourselves to Christ and to be part of the kingdom of God. Our last hymn is Blessed Be the Tie That Binds, 557.
next week is uh, Worldwide Communion Sunday. It's October, the first Sunday in October. And also spread the word around Alpha and also the Bible study. We like to have um, as many people come out as possible. Let us pray. The God of all grace who has called us to eternal glory in Christ, establish and strengthen you by the power of the Holy Spirit that you may live in grace and peace. Amen.